Okay, uh, once again, I, I want to get us started more or less on time. Uh, uh, again, I, ha I have one announcement or question for God damn it. Uh, again, for uh, panelists, if you didn't get or didn't get and want uh, the permission to record form, uh, I, I have some with me. Uh, and if you don't sign it now, it's, and it's not a big deal, we'll send you uh, a copy uh, afterwards, but it'll make the transactions a little easier if you get it now. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Intisar. Thank you, good morning. Uh, I'm glad to see all of you all this morning and I'm just joining the conference. Um, unfortunately, I'm just coming from, uh, from abroad in Iran, so I'm looking forward to uh, the panel here, which is accommodation in the age of the withering welfare state. Um, I won't say much here because we're starting a little bit late. Um, we don't have that much time and I wanna make sure everyone has their 15 minutes, which I'll try to make sure they stick to. Um, so we have some time for Q&A, but I'll just say that uh, the mandate for the panel uh, was for panelists generally to look at the impact of the regulatory state, uh, more specifically the welfare state, on claims to religious accommodation, um, and how does the rise of neoliberalism shape conflicts over the state's role in the provision of health care and the regulation of the family. So we have a number of perspectives here, and I'll turn it over. Uh, we'll just go in order, order, starting with Thomas Berg. Get my own alarm here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I'm uh, really glad to be here. It's been a very interesting uh, uh, and enjoyable conference and I thank the organizers for, for having me. Uh, so this is an important uh, uh, panel topic and I'm glad there's still people here today. Uh, uh, not as packed as it was yesterday, but this is an important uh, panel. Uh, with seven million people signed up under Obamacare, I'm not sure the welfare state is actually withering, uh, but uh, the relationship between religious accommodation and the active state is really at the core of the questions that we're uh, debating. Uh, let me say just a little bit about myself at the beginning for those who don't know. Um, I'm one of those people that uh, Steve Smith called yesterday, um, I think affectionately, uh, traditional mainstream liberals. Uh, I don't know if I call myself that, but, but I, I do uh, support many of the underlying um, laws that are in question in these disputes, uh, including same-sex marriage and uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and, uh, but I also support uh, uh, significant religious exemptions, and uh, that's the position I've tried to art uh, articulate in, in various fora. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, I think, will uh, argue, Elizabeth Sepper will argue that um, religious accommodations, or, or some of them at least, aim fundamentally to challenge the welfare state, um, undercutting protections for women, gays and lesbians, and, and workers. Uh, I, I disagree with that, uh, that kind of emphasis or that kind of uh, focus. I think religious accommodations are quite different from the kinds of constitutional challenges to the welfare state that succeeded in Lochner versus New York and that died out around uh, 1937 or after. Uh, religious accommodations, or many of them, can play a supportive role in a well-functioning welfare state. Uh, accommodation is one of the solutions to the general problem of protecting constitutional rights and interests in an activist state. Courts have faced this tension since the New Deal when they largely gave up limiting economic regulation under the Commerce Clause for, the, for Congress or liberty of contract for the states. Instead, as footnote four of the Caroline Products decision signaled in 1938, the courts assumed general uh, government power over the economy and instead enforced other provisions 
then affirmatively barred certain kinds of government actions, uh, discrimination against discrete and insular minorities, restrictions on speech and voting, restrictions on specifically enumerated rights in the first 10 amendments and so forth. Um, now, unquestionably, the expansion of social we welfare regulation creates new conflicts with the free exercise of religion. And religious freedom uh, fits within at least two of the categories uh, in the Caroline Products uh, uh, footnote. Uh, it is specifically enumerated, and it often involves vulnerable minorities. With religious freedom, the strategy to limit the increasing reach of government under the Caroline Products kind of approach has taken the form largely, not exclusively, but significantly, of accommodations of religion, court rulings or statutory provisions saying that otherwise valid regulation should not be an apl uh, applied in ways that significantly penalize the religious freedom of organizations or individuals. The key constitutional decision on this, as people have referred to, is Sherbert versus Werner, issued in 1963 by the Warren Court and written by its intellectual leader, William Brennan. Uh, as you know, the court held there that a Seventh-day Adventist woman could not be denied unemployment benefits because of her refusal to work on Saturday, her Sabbath, and that the government had to justify substantial burdens on religious freedom under strict scrutiny. Uh, the, court's man mandated accommodation, uh, the court mandated accommodation also in Wisconsin versus Yoder uh, involving the Amish, and legislatures enacted accommodations over uh, the succeeding decades, uh, just as they had uh, before Sherbert, and those accommodations in some ways increased as the uh, flow of government regulation increased. Uh, it's cr true that the Supreme Court held in Employment Division versus Smith that accommodations are not generally not required by the Free Exercise Clause, uh, but statutory accommodations, whether they are specific to a particular context or whether they're under a gen what might be called a general accommodation statute like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which uh, reinstates, as most of you know, the uh, compelling interest test. Uh, those uh, accommodations can and do still serve the values of protecting religious liberty and religious minorities. Uh, and e even the Smith case uh, recognized that the, the government has uh, power to uh, accommodate through uh, by its own discretion. Uh, and religious minorities can be seriously harmed, not, not just by flat out prejudice, uh, but by the majority's indifference or lack of knowledge, as is reflected in a, as may be reflected in a, in a general law. So accommodation of religion, I would say, whether it's constitutionally compelled or statutory, provides a method for balancing welfare state regulation and religious freedom. It allows religious exercise to remain free while regulation accomplishes its goal in the large majority of cases. I should say it allows religious exercise to remain relatively free. There are trade-offs at every point, of, of, of course, and we're, we're dealing with those, but the, the general thrust is that accommodation is a, is a mechanism for, uh, for taking both of these interests seriously if we are inclined to do that, and I think that's really the question of the hour is are we inclined to take both interests seriously? Um, accommodation, um, in fact, uh, tempers regulation without undoing it. Indeed, it often increases regulation's credibility or its likelihood of passage by removing objections to it based on religious conscience. Uh, this is one reason, not the only reason, but one why uh, I think accommodations are quite different from the Lochner regime. Challenges under Lochner versus New York logically aim to strike down the entire law in question as, a, as an interference with economic liberty. But religious accommodation, whether under RIFRA or a specific statutory provision, seeks an exemption for the claimant and others similarly situated. As a general matter, that is less disruptive by, sort of logically by nature that, to the government's regulatory goals than striking down the law in total. So, of course, the devil is in the details. The extent to which accommodations uh, undermine basic regulation depends, depends on the scope of accommodation. So what can we expect in the, in the key areas of contention here that we've been discussing? Um, and I, I'm uh, going to agree with, with much of uh, what, what Doug Laycock predicted or, or, or argued for in terms of the, the uh, specific areas of, of conflict uh, yesterday. Uh, with respect to for-profit businesses and anti-discrimination laws, uh, I've, I really doubt that exemptions will go uh, 
uh, very far under either RIFRA or specific uh, provisions to undercut the general application of laws to the commercial uh, context. In the anti-discrimination context, uh, the, uh, the justifiable exemptions uh, are for small businesses that, pro uh, let's say in the same-sex marriage context, uh, are for small businesses that provide services directly advancing the um, relationship, the, the wedding photographer, the, the marriage counselor, uh, when they don't affect people's overall access to services. Those are the only commercial discrimination cases that have ever won under the compelling interest test. They've won very occasionally. And they're the only ones that, um, that I, I've, um, and, and the group of scholars that I'm involved with, have ever proposed or are, are proposing in, in statutory accommodations. Um, the contraception mandate cases, uh, the decisions that have ruled for the, the for-profit businesses, um, I think have made uh, progressives really fearful of what the compelling interest test will do generally. It's certainly true that Hobby Lobby has changed the, uh, the discussion and the atmosphere on this. Uh, progressives are shocked that a 13,000 employee commercial business could get to square one, let alone win under the test. I think the contraception cases are unusual for a combination of reasons. Uh, most importantly, the government has found other ways to, sub to fund affordable contraception, whether it's through subsidies or in the case of accommodation for religious nonprofits through, pacing, through placing the duty on the insurer. Uh, at uh, oral argument, the court seemed quite interested in whether that arrangement might be extended to closely held for profits. The insurer pays accommodation is financially viable, and it might be regarding for-profits, too, because of another unusual feature of this case for, a, for the commercial context, and that is that by the government's own calculations, covering contraception saves overall costs and thus premiums. Uh, so there's a, there's a, that what is what made the, the nonprofit accommodation uh, possible. Uh, without uh, you know, removing the, the ability to, to get um, uh, contraception. Oops, wow. Sorry. I have four minutes? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you think I, know to, I would know how to work the thing. Uh, that also means that Hobby Lobby's objections, unlike those objections uh, of objectors to many other commercial reg regulations, are unlikely to be motivated by and probably won't produce any commercial advantage to them. That common problem with commercial accommodations is absent in the Hobby Lobby case. There is also the element of uh, abortion. Uh, as I argued in a brief on behalf of the Democrats for Life in the case, which focused on uh, solely on the uh, abortion uh, element of the case. We do have a distinctively broad and strong tradition of protecting uh, objections to abortion in this country, reflecting the seriousness of the potential harm in forcing someone to facilitate what he or she believes to be unjust killing of a human being. Uh, and that, as people mentioned yesterday, um, could apply to, and does in many people's view, apply to the death penalty and other situations. Uh, Abortion is the core case covered by the conscience clauses. Unlike virtually any other procedure or situation for those clauses, uh, they sometimes extend conscience protection for abortion to for-profit uh, corporations and to indirect facilitation, including through insurance coverage itself. Uh, I believe the RIFRA analysis can take that into account, uh, that tradition of broad accommodation of such objections. Now, whether or not preventing implantation of the embryo as a, uh, some of the uh, uh, methods uh, in Hobby Lobby may do is an abortion under federal law, the objectors believe it takes the life of a genetically distinct human person. And here I, I have to disagree with Caroline Corbin yesterday that the science is so obviously clear, at least on Ella, the five-day-after-pill or the seven-day-after-pill is sometimes, sometimes described. Um, during the FDA approval process in 2010, there was debate within the advisory committee itself on whether the efficacy of five to seven days was explained entirely by delayed ovulation and thus uh, solely pre-fertilization effects. Uh, the you know, the FDA went ahead with it, but the FDA's definition of abortion is, uh, is after uh, implantation. That, that debate is still, uh, is still out there, and of course the government and Secretary, Secretary Sebelius herself continue to say 
that Ella, as well as Plan B, which I agree is more doubtful, um, uh, can have uh, or may have uh, the effect of preventing implantation of a fertilized embryo. Under these circumstances, whatever the latest studies show, and I, I don't think they show it absolutely clearly, it seems to be perfectly reasonable that objectors fear it will have, uh, that Ella at least will have this effect. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm sure. Uh, I'll, I'll, I can talk a little bit about nonprofits in the, uh, in, the, in the question and answer session if anyone wants to. Uh, we have ample mechanisms for striking balances in various contexts without, uh, uh, that respect religious freedom without undermining government interests. The question is whether religious freedom is important enough to justify this effort. I think there's a growing sentiment uh, on the left sometimes expressed here to simply say it's not, it's not worth it. And uh, I think that's misguided from, uh, from progressive standpoints uh, as well. I've argued following uh, up on work by many others, including Bill Estridge and Kenji Yoshino, and others that there are important commonalities between religious objectors and same-sex couples. Uh, both are seeking protection from burdens on matters central to their identity and integrity, and we should try to protect both. The state shouldn't tell gays and lesbians you don't need to act on your orientation. It shouldn't tell a religious adherent, have your belief, but don't act on it. The state should not say you can act on your belief, uh, or I'm sorry, act on your orientation and your relationship, but keep it private. The state also shouldn't tell religious adherents to exercise their faith in their church and nowhere else. Um, uh, with that, are we, am I out of time? Okay, I will... Uh, I will stop there. Plenty of other things to say, including why the Mississippi Religious Freedom Restoration Act that just passed is a great thing. Uh, the Kansas uh, one that failed was an awful bill and rightly failed. And the Arizona bill, there's uh, room for reasonable disagreement. If uh, anyone wants to talk about those judgments, I'd be happy to. Thanks. I've already given you your questions. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Next up is Elon Meyer. Yeah, I hope so. I think Caroline wants to be on the list for comments. <laughs> oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? OK, so my name is Elon Meyer, and um, I have to come out and admit to you that I'm not a lawyer. And I'm presenting here from a very different perspective uh, than the ones that uh, most of the presentations here yesterday. And um, I'm going to talk about several areas of uh, potential research in uh, social science and public health that may be related to the topics that we've been discussing here, although there's no established field of work and specifically defined as uh, related to this topic. But before I start, I wanted to say, oh, I thought I have time here. I, I wanted to say one thing about uh, my observations yesterday and the night before. And I, I wasn't sure kind of what I was feeling, but in retrospect of the one day, it felt to me uh, very much like there was a, a case was presented that there's kind of an adversarial situation or procedure where on one hand you have uh, people who have or demand certain rights and on the other hand you have people who want to accommodate their religious beliefs and religious practices in view of those uh, rights. And that is not at all the way I would approach this uh, topic because I felt a little bit that that presentation uh, um, disengages the topic from the historical context of um, oppression and discrimination and equates the two groups in ways that they are not equal in the sense of understanding them from a social or sociological perspective. So yesterday uh, we talked uh, in particular about the legislated uh, accommodations and I don't want to add to that and the litigation in this area. Uh, but there were many areas that were not discussed that I, as a non-lawyer, can uh, include in this general topic. The first is the laws that have been described as no promo homo that are uh, 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 in, in these states and regions. And those laws basically prohibit um, the state, the school, to talk about 
really anything gay. Many of those laws came out and uh, started in the 80s, in the late 80s, in the context of public health prevention uh, against any kind of uh, public health uh, um, reason, suggesting that if you teach kids to be abstinent and not mention anything related to homosexuality, that will protect them from AIDS. There are other implications for these laws. For example, they cannot have a GSA. A GSA is a Gay Straight Alliance Club that has been uh, uh, helpful for kids in various schools and has been demonstrated in several public health research uh, projects, including one that I published with colleagues just uh, this month, to have an incredible implication for the health and well-being of gay and lesbian children, and when I say gay, I really mean LGBT, uh, in schools. For example, reducing the um, likelihood of, of uh, suicide attempts in schools that have sex education and a GSA compared to schools that don't. So, so for me, when I look at this map, I see uh, exposure to risks for health outcome. Another area that was not mentioned yesterday is exemptions that are sought and sometimes uh, uh, have already been given to um, schools for training counselors and therapists in what professional organizations require, which is a gay affirmative approach to treatment. So a counselor or therapist is not supposed to uh, uh, treat people of any kind based on their own belief systems if they do not agree with homosexuality, that is not supposed to be the approach for therapy. Rather, they're supposed to learn the accepted and, and agreed upon approaches, which I would generally describe as gay affirmative, being you have to kind of meet the patient or where he or she is and encourage them to be the best they can be. Well, several states, based on at least two uh, cases, one uh, in uh, uh, Augusta State University and one in uh, Mich Eastern Michigan University where students were not allowed to graduate for refusing because of their religious beliefs to uh, uh, adhere to the, the r rules that were uh, that this, the schools uh, applied based on accreditation requirements. And these laws are aimed to circumvent the uh, professional organization's <coughs> requirement so that the, the students will be able to uh, kind of get out of that requirement. Other types of accommodations, or again, not within the legal area that you guys think about, are informal procedures and practices that stem out of various politics. I got a call just uh, two months ago from a teacher who was very distressed because she was not able in her school to apply any kind of gay affirmative approaches to help students who are gay, lesbian, or, bi, uh, or, or transgender. And the shocking thing to me about this was this teacher came from Los Angeles uh, Unified School District, which is probably the most progressive in the country, and California, which is probably the most progressive in terms of laws protecting and offering uh, affirmative uh, 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 treatment of LGBT people. So, there are local politics that circumvent a lot of those uh, uh, legal issues that you were discussing here. And finally, there are all kinds of preventive uh, uh, responses, such as the APA notorious footnote four, which uh, critics say, in effect, uh, in accreditation, excuses religious organizations from a non-discrimination uh, practice so that they are allowed to discriminate against gay and lesbian students and faculty. There, more generally for me, as I said before, the context has to be considered that we're not starting from a, a, a level playing field. We're starting from an area where gay people have been traditionally and continue, to my mind, to be a, a disadvantage. Uh, one example of that was the letter by the uh, Department of Health Office of Civil Rights, where they offered uh, that uh, schools can protect children even if they're gay, even though there's no explicit gay uh, uh, legal requirement to do so. And that was met with extreme opposition by religious groups, including this letter by um, um, Roger Clegg from the Center for Equal Opportunity, who basically portrayed it as anti-homosexual folks like himself are not asking schools or governments to affirmatively do anything in advance to advance their agenda, other than leave them alone. 
It is the gay rights folks who want schools and, if necessary, the federal government to intervene. And um, to some extent, you can say facially that is correct, but the reason that it is correct is because those groups have not been protected and, in fact, have been discriminated against for, for, for centuries. So um, I want to talk now about four areas of uh, um, um, potential research. The first one is uh, the area of rhetoric and discourse, which has been uh, has received some attention in legal scholarship by Siegel and Eskridge, for example. Uh, but there are a lot of other approaches to understanding uh, uh, discourse and rhetoric. For example, uh, uh, the idea of framing, how you frame issues, has been uh, written a lot about by psychologists Kahneman and Tversky. By the way, the only psychologist who ever received the Nobel Prize uh, for this work. So, so there's a kind of interesting uh, area of work to do there. Uh, but I want to highlight in particular specific things that uh, are interesting to look at. The first, and that kind of goes against some of the presentations yesterday about, again, that kind of equal approach in front of the law, that a lot of the religious religiously motivated argument have actually been disguised as non-religious argument. And I think that reveals something uh, about maybe wonderful strategy, but also there's some kind of disingenuous uh, claim that it is just about religious, uh, 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 well, I wouldn't characterize it. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But, but, but the arguments that have been put forward were, number one, that it is for the safety of children, as in the HIV, no homo promo example. In the marriage debate, there has been a complete reversal from a very religious argument in, in the Proposition 8 propaganda and, and advertising to a, this is about the welfare of children who are being raised by parents. Uh, by gay parents. There's, of course, the libertarian and government non-interventionist argument and parental rights within the school context, which are not necessarily religious arguments, uh, although, of course, they're relevant. There's the presentation that gay people want special rights and interventions, as in the quote that I just read to you, that is really not about uh, um, uh, we, religious people are not wanting anything extraordinary, just that they don't want, they just want to be left alone, which, uh, which I don't see that way. There's an interesting attempt or, or effort to draw distinctions or oppose any analogies between uh, racism and homophobia, despite uh, what several speakers showed yesterday, a very interesting similarity in arguments for religious accommodations in the era of uh, racism. But it has been sometimes portrayed as even drawing similarities is itself racist. There are also been effort for at least 20 years to develop scientific base for the arguments. They are not necessarily, again, about religious arguments. Uh, this has uh, been most notoriously uh, recently uh, done with the Regnerus study that was uh, uh, really blew up in the Michigan decision uh, as non-effective, but this was certainly a very concerted effort, and it has been in the area of sexual orientation change for 20 years uh, at least. Um, and finally, there's uh, the adoption of the language of victimization by uh, religious uh, groups. I, I'm not saying who is doing that adopting, but, but how it's applied, really. And in particular, surprising to me is the notion that religious groups in the United States are stigmatized. And I've been asked that in at least one testimony or the position, at least two testimonies of the position, where aren't the Christian children or the Christian people in this example also stigmatized? And the answer is no. Stigma in the way that we understand it in sociology is not the same as maybe being discriminated against or even having prejudice against a group. Stigma has to do with a whole system of uh, dehumanizing, of, of, of devaluing the person for these characteristics. And I do not think that anybody could claim that in the United States, being Christian is a devalued identity in any community, certainly not in communities where there are overwhelming majority of the population. So the analogy to stigma from a sociology perspective is completely wrong, not just uh, 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 inappropriate. But I'm saying this because looking at uh, this course also allows us to find areas of commonalities and agreement. And I won't get into that, but there are a lot of discourses that are agreed upon by both people on the right 
and on the left, or, or religious and non-religious, for example, the need for safe schools. Uh, there are disagreements come in other areas, but this is certainly a very good and important way to negotiate, as some people suggested yesterday, and I can talk about this later. In the area of public opinion, I think we don't know enough, but we do know that if asked in a certain way, most people in America feel that uh, um, businesses should not be allowed to refuse service to gay people. This is despite most people in America believe 51% that sex between same-sex adults is wrong. So despite that, they feel that gay people should be protected in some ways. In addition, what we know from public opinions is there's a huge range among religions. So that when we talk about religious accommodations, we're really talking about some groups requiring these accommodations, and I understand that you all know that. But if you look at the, uh, uh, what religious people say, um, many of them, certainly in the mainline Protestant at the bottom there, say that um, gay marriages does not go against their religion. And surprisingly, and probably completely wrongly, many Catholics say that. So uh, the fact that we are seeking accommodations for some groups, this is really uh, very specific groups, and within those groups, perhaps certain minorities. So in general, most people don't agree that there should be accommodation, that, that, uh, that businesses could refuse services even within the context of a marriage and ceremonies. And this is true for both uh, um, um, small and businesses and large businesses. Um, I want to talk about religiosity of gay people. And I have two minutes. So I will um, just say that gay people themselves are religious as well, not as much as straight people but uh, they experience rejection within their churches, and that this rejection can lead to many adverse health outcomes itself. I know this is a little bit out of the topic here, but to understand that gay people themselves are religious, so when we talk about religious accommodation, we're not just talking about they versus us. There are many gay people within that. One example of the harm that happened is this recent study that showed that men who are uh, black men who have sex with men who come with an HIV, in, uh, in, uh, who are diagnosed with HIV, and those who went to, gay, to church, not to gay church, to black church, um, are arriving at the HIV diagnosis as a much worse state than those who didn't go to church, meaning they either didn't seek diagnosis early or didn't seek uh, a treatment for whatever they were experiencing or didn't uh, get screening uh, testing. Um, and finally, I would just like to say that, again, from my perspective, when you talk about religious accommodations, what I see from a public health uh, perspective and my particular interest in the health of uh, LGBT population is the denial of access to information, knowledge, services, goods, anti-discrimination protection and safety, which all together spells harm to gay people. And I just want to say, there are, I have a whole list of uh, examples of how this harm operates. I just want to say two things uh, before I finish. Um, and one thing is that uh, the sanctioning that is important part of law, and I think Louis mentioned that, uh, so I would skip that. The second thing is about the importance of what we call microaggressions or everyday discrimination as symbolic messages to people about their worth and place in society. And, and it, 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 I, I'm saying this because it a little bit annoys me when people dismiss uh, things like, well, you can always get a cake somewhere else, or you can buy flowers in another store. There is something a lot larger than the actual buying of the cake that is uh, 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 portrayed in a community when you're not allowed to get a, a cake in the store. Sometimes in small communities, there are not a lot of options. There are a lot of actually tangible uh, impact to those things. I'm working with the uh, uh, Southern Poverty on a case about a, a, a gay bar that was not allowed to open. And um, the closest other gay bar, being the only the closest other place where gay people can uh, uh, affiliate, is two hours drive away. So it's not just a symbolic thing, it's also a tangible uh, harm. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Melissa Murray. All right. 
Thanks so much to the conference organizers, and especially Mark, Nomi, Nan, Louise, and Doug, um, who have answered so many questions and done so much work to bring all of this to fruition. Um, I should say, um, in the tradition of my parochial school upbringing, I have a confession to make. Um, I have felt a bit like a fish out of water over the last day, because I actually don't write about religious exemptions, um, nor do I really write about anti-discrimination law in um, the traditional way. Instead, my work focuses on the regulation of sex and particularly on the ways in which criminal law and family law work cooperatively to regulate sex and sexuality and to construct the legal parameters of intimate life. And most recently, I've concentrated my attentions on the phenomenon of decriminalization and its repercussions for the regulation of sex and sexuality. And in particular, I've argued that Lawrence versus Texas, decided in 2003, reflects a sea change in the organization of sex and sexuality. Prior to Lawrence, criminal law and family law organized sex and sexuality in a binary fashion, which is to say that sex that was criminal was by definition sex that was ineligible for or inimical to marriage. And likewise, sex that occurred within marriage was per se licit and legitimate and not criminal. This binary organization of sex is clearly evident in cases like Griswold and Loving, where you have behavior that is criminally prescribed on one day, and the next day, the case is decided, and suddenly that behavior is deemed lawful and legitimate and marital. And in prior work, I've, organized, I've argued that Lawrence disrupts that organization in a particular way. In Lawrence, the court decriminalizes same-sex sodomy, but meaningfully does not make sodomy, nor those um, who participate in sodomy, eligible for marriage. Instead, Lawrence reorganizes sex and sexuality in a more continuous fashion, remaining at the two outer extremes, marriage and crime, as sort of sites of regulation, but interposing in between those two sites a zone of privacy um, where sex is neither marital nor criminal. And I've argued that that zone between marriage and crime is a zone of privacy or for non-marital, non-criminal sex or what I have termed non-marriage. And, and to be clear, when I say non-marriage here, I mean it purely in a descriptive fashion to locate the sex in question and the relationships in question outside of publicly recognized civil marriage. And so over the last day, as you all have had these conversations, I've been thinking about the conversation that I've been having um, with others about this idea of non-marriage, in part because the idea of non-marriage seems so outside of the conversations that have occurred here, and indeed from the larger debate about the collision of religious accommodations and civil <laughs> rights. And so in this talk, I want to try and reclaim a space for non-marriage. And I want to do this by focusing on two cases that have been discussed a lot over the course of the conference, Elaine Photography and Masterpiece Cake Shop. The facts of both of these cases are familiar to many of you, but let me just briefly rehearse them. In Elaine Photography, a small photography business in Albuquerque, New Mexico, owned and operated by a husband and wife team, um, was contacted by a lesbian, Vanessa Wilcock, who hoped that they would shoot her commitment ceremony to her partner, Misty Collingsworth. Upon receiving the email request, Elaine Higuenin, the, uh, the wife in the party, declined the request, saying that she didn't want to use her photographic skills to communicate the message that marriage can be defined as anything other than one man and one woman, and that doing so would have been contrary to her beliefs. In Masterpiece Cake Shop, Charlie Craig and his fiance, David Mullins, visited the cake shop in Lakewood, Colorado, to order a cake for their wedding reception. Critically, they weren't getting married in Colorado, where, which then did not recognize same-sex marriage. Instead, the couple planned to travel to Massachusetts, where they could marry, and then they would return home to Denver, where they would host a reception for friends and family, and indeed, the cake was intended for that Denver reception. Likewise, Stephanie Schmaltz and her partner, Janine, also contacted Masterpiece Cakes Chop, this time to order cupcakes to celebrate their commitment ceremony. In both instances, Jack Phillips, the owner of the cake shop, declined the business on the grounds that it would defy his religious convictions to provide cakes to celebrate a same-sex marriage. And indeed, when Craig and Mullins informed him that their marriage would be celebrated in Massachusetts, where same-sex unions were permitted, Phillips observed that such unions were not recognized under Colorado law, and in fact, they were actually illegal, his words. I want to briefly highlight some of the things that I see going on in these two cases. And the first thing I think is worth noting um, is something that Nelson noted yesterday in passing. 
The relationships in question here are not publicly recognized as marriages in the states in which the, supple, the couples lived and in which they sought the goods and services. Vanessa Wilcock and her partner, like Jeanine and Stephanie Schmaltz, were celebrating commitment ceremonies, private ceremonies that were certainly intended to celebrate the relationship in the couple, but that were by law not publicly recognized marriages. And indeed, even though the commitment ceremonies were to be public celebrations of the couples and their relationships, the fact the ceremonies would not result in any kind of public recognition. And indeed, as such relationships, they might actually be more properly understood as occupying that category between marriage and crime, the idea of a non-marriage, an intimate relationship that is neither marital nor criminal, and indeed private in its character. Likewise, Charlie Craig and David Mullins, although they were lawfully in married in Massachusetts, in Colorado they were not publicly recognized as spouses. The reception that they planned to host was to celebrate a relationship that under Colorado law was not recognized by the state as a marriage. In Colorado, it was a private non-marriage, an intimate relationship that was neither marital nor criminal and outside of state recognition and state regulation. With this in mind, the objector's responses for the request for goods and services is intriguing. Though all of these relationships were by law private and non-marital, both of the objectors understood them to be public marriages that would offend their private religious sensibilities. And to be clear, I don't mean to suggest that this is simply a matter of semantics. You say marriage, I say non-marriage. Instead, the objectors' responses reflect a very common impulse to translate all adult intimate relationships into the vernacular of marriage. That is, they reflect an impulse to read all adult intimate relationships through the lens of marriage. And to be clear, in some of these cases, it's not just the objectors who are making this translation. In these cases, the couples themselves want their relationships to be understood not as non-marriage, but as marriages and marriage-like. And that's not surprising. This is a panel about the withering welfare state. And I object to the idea that the ACA suddenly makes the welfare state front and center again. I mean, the ACA is certainly an important move forward but it cannot do away with the last 30 years of public divestment from public support for the family. And what has replaced that public support are private methods of provision, namely marriage and the marital family. So it is not a surprise in a time of incredible public divestment that marriage has become front and center as a way to keep families sustained and to keep them sustainable. So with this in mind, the exchange between Masterpiece Cake Shop and Charlie Craig and David Mullins takes on a very different cast. Recall that Craig and Mullins informed Phillips that their marriage would be lawful in Massachusetts, even though they lived in Colorado. And in response, Phillips informed them that, in fact, their relationship was illegal in Colorado. This dynamic, I think, recalls the marriage crime binary that historically organized sex and sexuality. Rather than reading Craig and Mullins' relationship through Lawrence's lens as a private, non-marital relationship, the exchange between Phillips and the couple seems to reinstantiate the earlier view that this is a relationship that can only be understood in terms of marriage or crime. It is either the marriage that the couple sees or it is a crime that Phillips understands. Neither of these parties understands the relationship as occupying a zone of privacy between these two zones of regulation. And this troubles me for two reasons. First, I think that the zone between marriage and crime, that zone of privacy, is a promising space of deregulation for relationships, or at least less thick regulation, a space that could provide greater opportunities for sexual liberty. And elsewhere, I've argued that we haven't explored the space of minimal regulation and instead have rushed to impose some form of state regulation on that space, foreclosing the possibility of a more robust discussion of non-marriage. To that vein, I find Elaine Photography and Masterpiece Cake Shop troubling because they reflect this development, the diminution of the space between marriage and crime and the elision of non-marriage that it produces. But I don't think that the elision of non-marriage is solely or even largely the work of religious objectors. In recent years, this critical space for theorizing and crediting non-marriage has narrowed as legal recognition of same-sex marriage has steadily expanded. And to be clear, I support marriage equality, but I think it is worth thinking critically about what is lost even as other rights are gained. As same-sex marriages have come online in various jurisdictions, 
We've seen alternative statuses like civil union and domestic partnership wither and die. In Connecticut, the legalization of same-sex marriage resulted in the conversion of existing civil unions into civil marriages. And the same thing is now happening in Washington with regard to domestic partnerships. In Berkeley, California, where I live, domestic partnerships were first implemented in the early 1980s. Yet, when Hollingsworth versus Perry was announced last summer, the Berkeley City Council met and agreed to respond to the decision by eliminating the domestic partnership registry on the ground that it was now obsolete in the face of statewide marriage equality. Now, obviously, we could think of these alternative statuses as obsolete in a world where all couples may marry. But we might also think of these alternative statuses as existing alongside marriage, introducing the possibility of relationship recognition pluralism, and more particularly for this conference, offering a space where those who dissent from the orthodoxy of marriage might have their relationships accommodated. I've seen the diminution of this space for non-marriage in my current project, where I've considered the public, um, public employees who seek to use Lawrence versus Texas to protect their private sexual conduct. In those cases, public employers recast the private sexual conduct of these unmarried employees as acts of public significance that justify state intrusion into the private sphere. In those cases, the space for non-marriage contracts as the public employer renders private sexual conduct public and publicly regulable. With all of this in mind, it is worth considering non-marriage in the context of these religious exemption cases in part because we should be more cognizant of creating and maintaining a space for non-marriage, and again, because we might think of this space as also a space of accommodation for those who depart or dissent or object to marriage itself. So with that in mind, let me briefly introduce another case, which is perfectly teed up for this conference, yet which no one has discussed at all, Brown versus Bowman. There, Cody Brown, and if none of you have watched Sister Wives on TLC, you are missing out. Um, Cody Brown is the star of Sister Wives, along with his four wives. And they've challenged Utah's criminal law, which prohibits bigamy and polygamy. Although the Browns understand themselves to be married in a religious sense, they have made very clear in their lawsuit that only Cody's marriage to his first wife is actually a civil marriage publicly recognized by the state, which is to say that is the only quote unquote marriage on the table. The other three relationships are marriage only in a private religious sense. For civil purposes, they are non-marriages, private relationships for which the Browns seek Lawrence's protections and the protections of religious accommodation from the state. In this way, Brown offers a compelling counterpoint to Masterpiece Cake Shop and Elaine Photography. In those cases, the parties insisted on treating non-marital relationships like publicly recognized marriage, and in doing so, laid the foundation for a claim of religious exemption. But in Brown, the Browns willingly inhabit the space of civil non-marriage. They are conscious of that space and conscious of the opportunity that it presents to be married only in a private religious sense. Accordingly, they seek laws protections for that space and the relationship that it occupies. It is their willingness to acknowledge and live in the space between marriage and crime that provides them with a claim of privacy and the foundation for a religious accommodation. Now, it's unclear how the Browns will fare as their case wends its way through the legal system. But it is clear, at least to me, that we could do more to be more precise about the distinctions between private beliefs and public recognition, whether through marriage or through state accommodation. We would do well to resist the urge to diminish the theoretical and practical space for non-marriage by rendering all intimate relationships marriages. And we would do well to understand some of these relationships not as marriages, but as private relationships in need of accommodation from the prevailing orthodoxy of marriage and the withering welfare state. Thank you. Great, thank you. And now we uh, go to last but not least, Elizabeth Sepper. Well, thank you, and thank you to the organizers, especially Doug. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the issues we've been talking about today under the gloss of free exercise Lochnerism. Um, now, I want to make clear that I'm narrowing my focus to for-profit businesses and their objections to social welfare legislation. I am actually a staunchly committed uh, 
to individual religious liberty and moral liberty to live out one's life. I am deeply skeptical, however, of institutional conscience writ large, but particularly in the instance of for-profit uh, businesses. Uh, so by way of overview, since the overturning of Lochner, it's been well accepted that libertarian economic arguments cannot supersede employee and consumer protective legislation. The rejection of liberty of contract meant the survival of workers' compensation, social security, wage and hour laws, and eventually health insurance programs and anti-discrimination laws. But what happens when religious liberty claims are advanced by businesses against this same legislation? Recent developments suggest that the answer may be that legislation protecting employees and consumers becomes vulnerable. My thesis is that religious liberty arguments in favor of businesses are strikingly similar to the use of liberty of contract during the Lochner era. Now, I don't use Lochner to mean judicial activism, but rather to invoke its doctrinal themes, what the courts actually said they were doing. Um, I also don't focus purely on the practical outcomes, such as the deregulation of business and the further degradation of the welfare state, although I believe that is a likely effect here as it was under freedom of contract. Instead, I want to think about the doctrinal themes or steps that today's jurisprudence shares with Lochner-era employment cases in particular. And looking at the shift in religious liberty through the lens of Lochner actually reveals the wider stakes, both doctrinally and practically. It avoids the temptation to view objections to contraception and same-sex marriage as women's or gays, gay rights issues, or to separate them from the broader constitutional order as mere examples of the so-called culture wars. Uh, so where do we see free exercise Lochnerism? I mean, essentially, I'm not going to rehash it for this audience, but across contraception, mandatory fill laws that require pharmacies to fill prescriptions, including for contraception and for HIV medication, um, against anti-discrimination statutes in the area of same-sex marriage, but also sex discrimination writ large, and also in the area of religious discrimination, where we see employers mounting claims that they have a religious identity that supersedes their employees' claims of religious discrimination. Now, a point of, uh, of clarification, the plaintiffs um, in the contraceptive mandate cases, of course, are proceeding most successfully uh, under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which might lead you to ask, how is this free exercise or Lochnerism? Um, isn't this just a statute? Now, free exercise Lochnerism may be a somewhat imprecise term, but I think it captures the concept, the spirit of what's going on here. Um, RIFRA has been described as a super statute. It requires a constitutional type analysis from courts. Um, it was meant to reestablish the constitutional strict scrutiny standard that existed prior to Smith um, and, and may in fact establish a new pseudo constitutional standard. And courts use it in a constitutional way. If you read the lower court cases involving the contraceptive mandate, they regularly conflate the free exercise clause under the US Constitution with RIFRA. Um, now, I do want to just briefly touch on Tom's point. That these, this is, these are just exemptions. They're not challenging the social welfare state. I think this is a little bit different. Um, in part, this has to do with what Reva and Doug touched upon, in that these aren't minority or anomalous claims being made, but rather majoritarian or even, or at least very powerful religious views being advanced. Um, also, this is a social insurance system um, in the case of the contraceptive mandate, and also anti-discrimination law similarly requires near universal or at least widespread uh, participation in order to actually function, in order to fulfill its purposes. Um, and what we haven't seen here is a limiting principle, right? If a for-profit corporation like Hobby Lobby can exercise religion and prevail in these cases, there is no limiting principle that has been proposed. Closely held corporations will not do it. 90% of corporations are closely held. They employ more than the majority of people in the United States. Um, so I have more I could say on that, but I want to move on to talk about what makes this Lochnerism. What are the themes I'm talking about? 
Um, first, both reflect a formalist notion of bargaining relationships between employers and employees. Um, the Lochner Court repeatedly rejected minimum wage laws, safeguards for unions, and maximum hour laws out of concern that to do otherwise would disturb the purported equality between people and businesses. So too, courts reviewing recent free exercise claims of businesses have accepted a formalist notion of the employment relationship. Instead of recognizing the power imbalance between employer and employee, they ascribe to the relationship of voluntarist hue. And in fact, some corporations have succeeded in challenging the contraceptive mandate by claiming that the for-profit corporation is openly religious and employees are not unfairly surprised by its perspective. Absent is an acknowledgment that employees are not uh, on equal terms with their employers. Also, in the area of an employee benefits contract, there's even less of a bargain for arrangement than in the employment context, since virtually all employees, and actually very few employers, know what is covered by the plan. Okay, the second theme is that the status quo ante is taken as a neutral baseline, which imposes no burdens, economic or religious, on anyone. And I want to dwell on this for a moment. So Cass Sun Sunstein has argued that the problem with Lochner was that the court's decision took as natural and inviolate, he says, a system that was legally constructed and took the status quo as the foundation from which to measure neutrality. So in the view of 1920s and 1930s federal courts, requiring protection for employees was an unsustainable burden on employers. Um, in Adkins v. Children's Hospital, the Supreme Court court expressed concern for the calamitous effects on employers of the minimum wage, saying it ignores the necessities of the employer irrespective of the ability of his business to sustain the burden, generously leaving him, of course, the privilege of abandoning his business as an alternative. The maximum hours legislation challenged in Lochner itself also distributed from employers to employees in the short term and in the long term from consumers to employees. Now, it was only when courts recognized that the status quo delivered subsidies to employers who engaged in free riding off the community that Lochner met its end. Today in the free exercise uh, litigation, we see the same deference to the status quo ante and unwillingness until recently to consider the burdens on third parties of accommodation or of the status quo ante, that is. Um, the effects on businesses of covering contraception are expressed as, quote, a stark dilemma, either comply with the contraceptive coverage requirement and violate their religious convictions, or refuse to comply and face ruinous penalties. Similarly, in the anti-discrimination context, laws requiring businesses to serve same-sex couples who are marrying are described as uh, potentially driving objectors out of business altogether. Of course, in the Lochner era, the employer-employee model of the Industrial Revolution was new, and the common law was the baseline. Here, the status quo that the Affordable Care Act disrupts and the federal courts seem intent on preserving is entirely a construct of state and federal law. We have the Employee Retirement Income Security Act that impedes the ability of states to regulate health insurance products, right? We have contraceptive mandates in 26 states already, but employers could get out from under it by self-insuring under ERISA and escaping any regulation at all. We also have an enormous subsidy to employers uh, from the government to offer compensation in the form of health insurance rather than wages. Um, the challengers here, in effect, insist that they are entitled to this subsidy no matter whether their insurance plans live up to federal standards. Um, and this is Hobby Lobby's complaint that dropping insurance would now uh, cost it $26 million in taxes. Question this number, and I could explain to you why it's wrong. I um, mean, this is the lower number they use, uh, and that they would have to raise wages as a result, which is no doubt correct. Um, so the third theme is that judicial decisions in the early 20th century and now in the early 21st century advanced an ideology of personal responsibility uh, 
that renders the obligation of a business toward its employees minimal. So when the Adkins court uh, in the Lochner era accepted that an employee may have an ethical right to a living wage, it refused to concede that the employer bore any duty to provide it. Um, likewise, free exercise objections to contraceptive coverage, spousal benefits for same-sex couples, and the employer mandate generally, there have been religious objections to the employer mandate as a whole, um, generally portray employee benefits as largesse from the employer to which employees have no rights. Um, and challengers claim that the government seeks to force them to pay for these benefits, despite agreement among economists that benefits are part of employee compensation, like wages. Okay, so finally, uh, and I'd be remiss in a conference like this not to mention this point and delve into it a bit more, as in Lochner, gender here may act as a wedge issue that moves doctrine broadly. Um, in the progressive era, reformers used concerns over women's workers' health, and in particular their reproductive capacities, to make inroads into constitutional doctrine. And for decades, this analytical focus um, caused women protective legislation to survive constitutional scrutiny, even as general labor protective legislation could not meet the constitutional standards. And we now recognize that gender actually acted as an entering wedge to dismantle doctrines that restricted the ability of the state to regulate business. Indeed, the Supreme Court's 1937 decision in West Coast <coughs> Hotel v. Parrish to uphold a minimum wage law for women is considered to have overruled Lochner generally, leading to the passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act, a general minimum <coughs> wage law, in the following year. So today, gender again is operating, it seems to me, to destabilize doctrine, albeit in a regressive rather than a progressive way. But in the modern context, gender is operating in a contradictory way that confuses me, and I'm not sure what to make of it. Maybe you'll help me sort it out. Um, because on the one hand, the gendered nature of contraception and sexual orientation discrimination and sex discrimination prevents the public from identifying the larger stakes. The public perception is that these cases uh, are about gender or sexual activity rather than the broader labor or regulatory state as a whole. Uh, in the contraceptive mandate litigation, the women, woman worker is portray portrayed as demanding and inadequately grateful to her employer. Um, note that contraceptive benefits accrue to the benefit of male workers as well, whose families are covered. Um, objecting businesses ask, why can't women just pay for their own contraceptives? Um, and litigation in the context of sexual orientation anti-discrimination also presents same-sex couples as insisting on approval of their conduct when they have ample opportunity to simply seek goods and services elsewhere. Um, and this perception, I think, is affecting the judiciary, as is most apparent in their skepticism toward contraception, or at least emergency contraception, as health care at all. Um, on the other hand, Right? And on the one hand, gender seems very obvious. On the other, gender is arguably obscured. Um, objectors disclaim any sex discrimination or gender stereotyping at work. And I want to note here, anti-discrimination law will be vulnerable if Hobby Lobby wins. This case is about sex discrimination, as the EEOC recognized denying contraceptives as part of a plan that covers prescription drugs generally is sex discrimination. Um, so, uh, lost my train of thought. Um, uh, so, at the same time, almost every court to have considered this, right, overlooks the women workers affected by this. I mean, thanks to Fred Geddix, this is coming to the surface again, um, but it has been uh, obscured, I think, so far. So ultimately, I do think that Lochner era gendered arguments, which of course led to the dissolution of the market libertarian outcomes and weaken the doctrine of freedom of contract, um, that here again we'll see corporate conscience cannot be quarantined to gender, 
There's no limiting principle and gender may operate again to destabilize constitutional understandings, this time to the detriment of workers and to the welfare state. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone and thank you for, for speaking here so that I could uh, get you to stick to your 15 <laughs> minutes. I was worried that Elizabeth might stay over there. Um, so we'll open it up to, to questions and answers and I'll take moderator's privilege to ask a first one, trying to tie together some of the themes that I think came out. We have about 10 minutes with the permission of um, the organizers and depending on how many questions there are, maybe we can take another five minutes since we began uh, five minutes late. Uh, but some of the themes that, that came up are ones that I want to highlight, but also um, add another dimension to um, through uh, discussing something about the Islamic law perspective on religious accommodation and some of the issues that have, that have arisen here. Uh, through the, the illuminating talks that you gave, um, there, there seem to be at least three dichotomies, law versus ethics or values. Uh, public versus private, um, a sphere of regulation versus a sphere of liberty um, in the relationship between religious accommodation and the modern welfare state. Um, now to take it back a little bit more in the Islamic, medieval Islamic law context, so prior to any modern welfare state, um, it's issues that, that we're talking about of religious accommodation uh, and, and liberty have been under-theorized, um, or religious accommodation and other rights have been under-theorized, but it seems that privacy is the, the value that is emphasized when it comes to accommodation. Um, two examples come to mind. One is there is a practice of Zoroastrians, uh, alleged practice of Zoroastrians marrying, sons marrying their mothers after their father had passed away. The understanding is that this wasn't in fact a marriage, but a way to preserve inheritance and keep it uh, within the family. Uh, and this was overlooked by Muslim jurists and the state, so long as it was kept private uh, and, and there wasn't a lot of argumentation for making this a regular part of Islamic law. And the same with same-sex relationships, which were apparently prevalent uh, in medieval Islamic context, so long as they weren't public, um, there was no problem. Um, but uh, in, in the modern Muslim world, and some of these um, conversations may be relevant to, to what we're talking about now, uh, the privacy argument becomes the problem. So a way of bringing liberty into the public sphere is to challenge the laws um, that force um, these alternative types of relationships to be private. So I'd love for you to, to sort of comment on any of that as it relates to your work as you see fit. We can go down the line and then open it up to uh, everyone else. Anything to say, Tom? Um, well, I mean, I guess I, uh, without without knowing the, the situation, I guess I'm, I'm struck by the emphasis there that the toleration is for the relationship if it's kept private and that, that that's a very you know major major restriction on on the tolerance and it's one that with respect to same-sex relationships we no longer accept that kind of restriction and I think quite rightly rightly so we no longer uh, accept it uh, and uh, um, the question, I guess, as I, as I frame the religious accommodation debate, is whether we're going to say a somewhat similar thing or analogous thing to the religious objector and say, have your objection uh, as long as it's kept private. But once it comes out in public, then the state will, will uh, come down on you. So that, that's, you know, back to my framing of the issue, but I, I think that's an unavoidable um, irony in uh, making claims for strong anti-discrimination laws and then dismissing the religious objector. 
I actually agree with that. Um, I think the privacy issue is a problem when you are claiming uh, rights that are to be enacted in the public, so it becomes a limiting uh, uh, or, or really m meaningless to have the right to do it in private. I wonder what Melissa says. Objections, Melissa. <laughs> So I, 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 I speak of privacy because Lawrence speaks of privacy, but I, mean, I actually think the more productive way to think about that space between marriage and crime isn't as much about privacy as about an absence of regulation or the absence of really thick regulation that you might find in either of those two places. So obviously, alternative statuses are not private in a strict sense. They are publicly recognized, but they are also not the same as marriage. I mean, that, that's the whole debate in many of the, in the same marriage equality cases. Are they separate but equal? Are they like marriage? Are they not like marriage? Um, in Berkeley, when domestic partnership was first established in the early 1980s, it was consciously modeled as an alternative to marriage, and it purposely had fewer benefits than marriage. It was not the same, and you know, it offered some form of public recognition, but also less regulation. And Again, like if you want to dissolve your domestic partnership, you go down to City Hall and you sign some paperwork. You don't have to have a divorce and the unwinding of the partnership. So I think the more productive way to think about that is about the sort of, sort of a sliding scale of regulation. So I was thinking a lot about the public-private point, especially during your presentation, Melissa. Um, and I think there, one thing is we're not sure what we mean by public versus private, and part of it is we think of private as you know, the family or who you decide to date or what you do in the privacy of your bedroom. Um, but we also sometimes use it to mean private law, right? That businesses should be able to contract with their employees as they see fit, even though they've entered a commercial space that arguably is public and certainly is highly regulated. Um, so I think those meanings of private sometimes confuse things, especially when we have systems like the ACA or like uh, workers' compensation insurance programs that require private entities like the employer to play a role, even as the government plays another role, and that together it works as a comprehensive system. Thank you. Questions, comments, and questions? So these are all fascinating uh, presentations. My question goes chiefly to Liz and Tom, uh, although other people's thoughts are welcome. And it arises out of uh, conversations uh, I was having at dinner yesterday. And, it goes to what not the holding in the Hobby Lobby case should be, but, but the form of the case. So there's an argument that this is not a time for judicial minimalism, that uh, you know, this is a time like Roe, like Miranda, where it, is, it behooves the court to set out a landscape because the alternative would be what Kennedy correctly called with respect to the Establishment Clause, a jurisprudence of minutiae and lots and lots and lots of cases. On the other hand, uh, these cases went to the court at a very early stage of development with, without a lot of facts, um, you know, without a lot of sense even what the millions of situations there are, even with respect just to the contraception mandate, let alone other RIFRA-like accommodations for other um, for-profit corporations. So I wondered, uh, you know, whether this should be a minimalist or a maximalist decision and what the consequences would be of it being one or the other. I guess I'm not even sure what judicial minimalism means in this context exactly. I think the uh, decision that would have least effect would be, or that would be less likely to result in all the minutia and further litigation would be a decision that there is no such thing as corporate conscience for a for-profit business, period, the end. And I think that would stop most of these claims, right? I think a decision that well, we're going to skip over that and go straight to substantial burden, compelling interest, and decide. Um, even if they decide that the government prevails, I think leaves the door open to greater litigation. Um, so I'm not sure what would happen there. I do think that if they, even if they say this is limited to the contraceptive mandate context, we are not going to say anything about anything else. This only applies here. I don't see how that holds the line for future litigation um, in any limiting way. And the idea that closely held corporations as a way of narrowing it is, is simply wrong. You can't have a data set that includes <coughs> nine out of 10 corporations and call it a narrow ruling. 
Um, I guess I'd probably be on the side of Marianne. Oh yeah, there you are. Um, uh, on the side of judicial minimalism here. For I think basically the reason that you articulated that this is kind of the first time that the court has dealt with something quite like this or in this context. I mean, you could say United States versus Lee is this summer and so on. But I mean, it's. Um, I mean, I think it's really important to get some right general principles um, as opposed to, uh, uh, I mean, I think the holding in the case matters a lot, but I'm particularly concerned that in a case like this where the, uh, where the, the, the feelings, I don't mean to dismiss that, but I mean the feelings on both sides run so high, I think it's important for the court to get principles right. Um, and uh, then you know the, re the result will, will will come out. I suspect it will be a a, a result that the, that the court will explain fairly narrowly one way or the other, if only because it's probably going to be a five to four case. Um, I do think that if the court said there's no such thing as corporate conscience, I would hope that progressives would be aghast at that. Um, you know, there uh, what, what what we say about this is not just a sort of technical point about the free exercise clause or about RIFRA, and I agree with Elizabeth on that, but it's also not simply a question of what strategy, you, you know, what, what things you say in the course of getting to the result that you want. For progressives to say there's no such thing as corporate conscience would rebound really badly on a lot of other things that progressives ought to care about, I think. Yeah, I, mean, I, I guess, this goes to, I think you're, you're both agreeing that the simple answer, um, and I do mean simple, is there's no such thing as corporate conscience. I guess what I'm asking is, if the court doesn't take that position, if it says there is such a thing as corporate conscience, is now the time to spell out what the conditions of corporate conscience are? Or do we say, there is such a thing as corporate conscience, like the Ankel decision said, there is such a thing as same-sex sexual harassment, and then say no more about what it would entail. I'll do the long line, so. Uh, so let's go to the next uh, questioner and um, you know, fold that in if you, if you have, in your next answer, if you have opinions on whether the court should be maximalist in defining uh, its terms. Catherine. I don't have any view on this question. Sorry, Marianne. <laughs> um, First of all, I want to thank all of you. This was a really fabulous panel. Um, and I'm sorry that some of the folks who presented yesterday weren't able to attend today's, uh, this panel. Because um, I was a bit um, alienated by what counted as evidence um, uh, in some of the arguments that have been made over the last day and a half, uh, and how we conceptualize um, injury and um, relative relationship of, of, of certain groups to power. Um, and I think there's a reset that happened in the way you guys talked about it today. So I want to thank you for that. So my question, I actually have questions for each of you, but I'm going to focus on Melissa. <laughs> um, uh, to, not to re-ask the question about privacy that, that um, Intisar asked, but to, I, I want to ask a little bit more about why privacy to structure the space between marriage and um, criminalization, and I think Liz did a nice job of thinking that a little more complexly as a, an absence of state regulation and a place for private ordering rather than privacy being spatial in nature. Um, uh, but why privacy and not liberty? And I want to invite you to take the frame of analysis you used for sodomy and family law and apply it to reproductive rights. Is it, would this be a useful frame for thinking about the decriminalization of abortion and contraception into a zone of non-state regulation, either structured by privacy or liberty? Um, so privacy or liberty, I, I think Lawrence conflates the terms and sort of uses liberty and privacy in an interchangeable way, ultimately coming down on the side of liberty. Um, I use liberty here because it seems to me that what the objectors are speaking of is public marriage, like public civil, publicly recognized civil marriage, and they are sort of juxtaposing that against their private religious beliefs. And so that's one of the reasons why I thought that was particularly productive, to sort of think about this as sort of an ironic space where 
one man's privacy is turning another man's privacy into something very public and subject to, and, and, and therefore a basis for the, um, the accommodation. Um, the sodomy family law distinction, I, I think, does work really well in the context of status relationships. I think it also could work in the context of reproductive rights. Um, you know, I, I discussed in Strange Bedfellows, which you and I have talked about a lot, um, one way to think about the prohibition on abortion and contraception are not necessarily as restrictions on status relationships per se, but rather about restrictions on what the character of those status relationships should be. So that we might understand a criminal restriction on contraception to be sort of suggesting that the character of civil marriage is procreative in nature, and that's why um, contraceptions are pro contraceptives are prohibited and why abortion is prohibitive, that it sort of speaks to the character of marriage. I think where it becomes harder in the modern context is that obviously contraceptive use is not necessarily about marriage or speaking to the character of marriage, but rather about sexual liberty, as, as you say. And the status relationship doesn't encompass all of that, as I think I've tried to show in my work, that there is that space in between marriage and crime where you might have some status relationships, maybe alternative statuses that are less regulated, but you might also truly have something that is completely outside of state regulation. And I think that is a productive way for thinking about reproductive rights in this context. That I, I know that Justice Ginsburg has, says that, has said that equal protection would be the better location for thinking about these kinds of questions. But I still think there's something productive about thinking of them in the context of liberty, so long as liberty isn't tethered to the idea of those status relationships. So we have just a couple of minutes, and if I'm excluding people who might just want to drink, um, of the people that are standing up, I think there are about six people who still have questions. So I would propose just taking all of the questions, and um, if that's OK with you all, um, and giving you a 30-second response, <laughs> if you choose to give one. Sure. Um, two, I hope, very quick points. First, with regard to uh, refer perhaps with Bill Eskridge here, it does seem to me that one could, argue, if there is some analytical bite to the notion of super statutes or Ackermanian sort of moments, then it would seem to me interesting to play RIFRA through that quite independently of what one thinks of RIFRA substantively, uh, but it certainly came after a lot of debate and was clearly designed to overturn what was thought to be an objectionable Supreme Court decision through a very complicated political process. And if you buy into Ackermanian argument, which I do, then you know he just published Civil Rights Revolution talking about the seminal statutes of the 60s. It does seem to me, for better and maybe for worse, RIFRA is a very important statute in the 90s. The other point is directed uh, at, at Elizabeth's presentation. I confess I've gotten very suspicious of arguments about there are no limiting principles. This is broccoli. And it does seem to me that it is, quite frankly, a pathology of a legalist approach to believe that law and politics are matters of principle and you have to, you know, you have to argue them out to the very end with limiting principles or the lack of limiting principle being defeating. And because one of the other words that has been much in evidence, especially yesterday, is compromise. And it does seem to me that compromise, and I don't mean this negatively, is in its own way unprincipled. Not that people don't have principles, but they recognize that you're never going to be able to get all you want, you deal, and Ronald Dworkin doesn't like checkerboard ordinances, but that's exactly what compromise and law involves, legislation involves, and to say, well, this is invalid because it's really messy and we don't know what the limiting principles are, I increasingly find just not compelling as a way of analyzing public policy. Um, thank you to the organizers for bringing this panel together, especially to bring Ilan and Melissa on the same panel. <laughs> Since 
there's a link that hasn't been spelled out, but Ilan mentioned there's also, of course, the group who are gay and religious at the same time. And the sort of accommodation that you mentioned but in the continuum, you say it's useful to accommodate the dissenters who don't want the marriage. It's also useful, I would think, for especially those groups, or perhaps couples where one of them is deeply religious and gay, and they want to have something. We already have cases in the European Union where then they say, well, you get some of the benefit of marriage, but you don't have to marry because your marriage might be a bridge too far for the family, for example. <laughs> so I really liked the notion that so this is a form of accommodation, and it sort of also it values all kinds of other partnership forms. They're not just useful stepping stones in, on the way to marriage. They're useful in themselves because people are different and maybe different place-wise and, and time-wise in their development. So perhaps you agree. <laughs> I just want to uh, draw attention to what I see as a theme uh, that's been running through the conference that I find interesting and important but hasn't been uh, drawn out. And that is the theme of baselines. Um, uh, one of the predicates of the argument, the burden shifting argument uh, against religious exemptions is that, um, uh, that uh, the deprivation experienced by third parties is, counts as a burden, right? When we're dealing with the welfare state, there's been an argument um, that it doesn't count as a burden because there's no right to, for example, contraception coverage in the first place. That argument is run by uh, Michael McConnell on Thursday night. Um, and I think it's come up in various ways, but it also comes up in the public accommodations uh, area, right? Where the common law, and this is, I think, this, this came up in Andy Koppelman's paper and also in, in Liz's paper, where the common law baseline is, is presumed to be uh, libertarian. Right, so um, businesses can refuse to serve people with, I think his example is eyebrows with, you know, short, that are shorter than three inches or whatever. Um, and uh, ex and, and uh, anti-discrimination statutes are exceptions to that baseline, right, that then have to be conformed to. Um, but I've started to look into that a little bit and it seems to me that there's a counter narrative, you could, you could say, running through kind of US law and um, that begins with kind of Blackstone uh, and some early cases in English common law um, that businesses, once they hold themselves open to the public, have to serve all comers, right? Um, and that the libertarian baseline that was established by statute in many states after the Civil War had kind of um, not so nice uh, background, right? Um, because it was used uh, out of, in, in order to protect businesses that might have to, under the common law rule, open their doors to um, newly freed slaves and, and other um, African Americans. Um, uh, and, and if that's the baseline, right, or if we can start to, to tell a story where the common law baseline is constructed rather than given and also constructed in ways that differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction without, within the United States, I found at least one jurisdiction, New Jersey, that has a, a non-libertarian common law baseline. That is, if, if this is the rule today in New Jersey, if you hold yourself open to the public, you have to serve everybody, even people with eyebrows longer than three inches. <laughs> Um, uh, within reasonable means. So I'm, I'm wondering, I guess I'm interested mostly in Tom's reaction to that and how it affects um, kind of accommodations that you've, and this is an honest question for me because I think uh, it's not at all clear where the law is today in a lot of jurisdictions. A lot of people just haven't asked what the common law baseline is and how we should think about it. But it might affect um, arguments for accommodations in the for-profit sector that, that um, you've argued for. And also to Liz, if you have any reflections on how to, how to um, arbitrate between these two narratives about common law baselines. So, as I understand it, at the heart of the debate over the regulatory state and the public-private distinction that came up several times, um, lies the debate over whether rights are positive or negative. And as I understand it, any time a right imposes obligations on others and makes them pay, it is, by definition, a positive right. The idea of facilitation is based on the insight that when I enter into an economic relation with you, that has an effect on what you can do. And what you do has an effect on what I am responsible for. And therefore, you have a responsibility to act in a way that doesn't make me complicit with criminal or sinful things. That's a logic of positive rights. It's completely incompatible, I think, with the idea that the rights in question are negative. So my question for Tom 
is how can proponents of the right to accommodation, when it's based on this facilitation theory, simultaneously sort of require the recognition of the positive nature of the rights that, that, are, that they are claiming should be protected, while it seems to me that's going hand in hand with the denial of the recognition of the positive dimension of reproductive rights. Um, to Liz, I would ask or maybe suggest, might it, it's just sort of like clarification, might it be better to say that the claim to a right to religious accommodation is being presented, it sounds like a Lochner style right, which is merely freedom from regulation. But when you get inside the substance of the facilitation claim, it actually turns out to be a, a positive right sort of bundled up inside the skin or the rhetoric of a negative libertarian freedom from regulation right. And then sort of the same question posed to Melissa, which I think is returning to Catherine's question, I don't know if either privacy or liberty as freedom from, as a negative right, freedom from, right, I mean, this is an old point. I don't think I want reproductive rights to be construed as merely negative rights. I can't give myself an abortion. I can't, or except in the most harrowing ways. I can't provide myself contraception. We have to recognize that, pot, that reproductive rights have a positive rights dimension. Thank you all. If there are one sentence remarks that you want to well, say, we can, or we can. Do you want to say can anything? I, can I say one? Since several of these were directed at me, I'll try to say one long sentence. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Sandy, Nelson, and Nomi in, uh, in this one sentence. Um, I, I think I agree with Sandy that we uh, and the court balances and draws lines all, all the time. Sometimes, especially in the legislature, that's just politics. Um, I wouldn't want to say it's entirely lacking in the relevance of principle, though, because I think we also draw lines and care about, I don't know where you are, Sandy, but, uh, oh, there you are. Uh, we, we, we draw um, fine lines when we care about the interests on both sides, right? And that's what I keep coming back to here, is that if we care about the interests on both sides, then we're going to look for ways that may draw, involve draw, drawing fine lines, and that's just fine if we have to do that because there's something important on both both sides. Nelson, um, very quickly, I Semi-colon. think the critique. <laughs> what's that? Yeah, that's Semi-colon. what it's said. I, I'll say it really quickly. Uh, I think the common law baseline um, sh- should give way if the question is the government's power to regulate in the first place. That's I think that's right. Um, the question is whether when a countervailing uh, enumerated right uh, that we should care about, I argue. Um, I, th- I think market logic can be part of, an, of a way of accommodating that right. I don't think it defines it. I don't think it's the framework. You know, I don't want essentialism here. I don't want market essentialism. But it's part of the framework in which we make room for somebody to dissent if we care about that. Nomi, I don't know how to answer that question. So, Thank you. Sorry. Offline. All right. Please join me in thanking our panel.